This is Crime, Mr. Wade, bringing you the stories. Stay tuned for a lot more. Welcome to another unfortunate story. I'm Mr. Wade and Mrs. Crime. If you haven't already done it, go ahead and subscribe. If you haven't done it already, go ahead and click that like button. Today's unfortunate story is about a Miss Sylvia Marie Likens. She was an American teenager who was tortured and murdered by her caregiver, Gertrude Benazuski. Many of Benazuski's children and several of their neighborhood friends. The abuse lasted for three months, occurring incrementally before Likens died from her extensive injuries and malnourishment on October 26, the year of 1965, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Likings was increasingly tormented, neglected, belittled, sexually humiliated, beaten, starved, lacerated, burned, and dehydrated by her tormentors. Her autopsy showed 150 wounds across her body, including several burns, scald marks, and eroded skin. Through intimidation, her youngest sister, Jenny, was occasionally forced to participate in her mistreatment. The official cause of her death was determined to be a homicide caused by a combination of cerebral hematoma and shock complicated by severe malnutrition Gertrude Benazwiski her eldest oldest daughter Paula her son John and two neighborhood youths Coy Hubbard and Richard Hobbs were all tried and convicted in May 1966 of neglecting torturing and murdering likings. At the defendant's trial, Deputy Prosecutor Leroy New described the case as the most diabolical case to ever come before a court or jury. And Gertrude's defense attorney, William C. Eckberg, described likings as having been subjected to acts of degradation that you wouldn't commit on a dog or before her death. After eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Gertrude Bozinski guilty of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to the imprisonment but was released on parole in the year of 1985. Paula was found guilty of second-degree murder and was released in the year of 1972. Hobbs, Hubbard, and John were found guilty of manslaughter and served less than two years in the Indiana Reformatory before being granted parole on February 27th, the year of 1968. The torture and murder of Sylvia Likings was widely regarded by Indiana citizens as the worst come ever committed in their state and has been described by a senior investigator in the Indianapolis Police Department as the most sadistic case he had ever investigated in his 35 years served with the Indianapolis Police. Gertrude Nadine Banaszewski, born September 19, 1928, was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, to the both parents of Hugo Marcus Van Falsen Sr. and Molly Myrtle, both of whom were originally from Illinois and were of English and Dutch descent. Benazuski was the third of six children, and her family was a working class. On October 5, 1939, Benazuski saw her 50-year-old father die from a sudden heart attack. Six years later, she dropped out of high school at age of 16 to marry an 18-year-old John Stephen Benzuski, 1926-2007, who was originally from Youngsville, Pennsylvania, and was of Polish ancestry. 
and with whom she had four children. Although John Benazuski had a volatile temper and occasionally beat his wife, the two would remain together for 10 years prior to their first divorce. Following her divorce, Benazuski married a man named Edward Guthrie. This marriage lasted just three months before the couple divorced. Shortly thereafter, Benazuski remarried her first husband, with whom she had two children. The couple divorced for the second time in the year of 1963. Weeks after her third divorce, Benazuski began a relationship with a 20-year-old welder named Dennis Lee Wright, who also physically abused her. She had one child with Mr. Wright, Dennis Lee Wright Jr. Shortly after the birth of her son, in May 1964, Wright abandoned Benzuski. Shortly thereafter, Benzuski filed a paternity suit against Mr. Wright for financial support of their child. Although Wright seldom contributed to the care of their son. By the year of 1965, Benzuski lived alone with her seven children. Paula, age of 17, Stephanie, age of 15, John, the age of 12, Marie, the age of 11, Shirley, the age of 10, James, the age of 8, and Dennis Lee Wright, Jr., at the age of 1. Although she was 36 years old and 5 feet 6 inches, she weighed only 100 pounds and has been described as a haggard, underweight, asthmatic chain smoker suffering from clinical depression due to the stress of three failed marriages and failed relationships and a recent miscarriage. In addition to the sporadic checks she had received from her husband, a former Indianapolis policeman upon whom she primarily relied for financial support for her children. Benazuski occasionally performed odd jobs for her neighbors and acquaintances, such as sewing or cleaning in order to earn money. Benazuski resided in Indianapolis at 3850 East New York Street, where the monthly rent was $55. Sylvia Marie Likens, born January 3rd, year of 1949, was the third of five children born to the carnival workers, Lester Cecil Likens and his wife, Elizabeth Betty Francis. She was born between the two sets of paternal twins, Danielle and Diana, two years older than her, and Barry and Jenny, one year younger than her, and Jenny Lichen suffered from polio, causing one of her legs to be weaker than the other. She was afflicted with a notable limp and had to wear a steel brace on one leg. Lester and Elizabeth's marriage was unstable. They often sold candy, beer, and soda of carnival stands around Indiana throughout the summer, moving frequently and regularly experiencing severe financial difficulties. The Lycan's sons regularly traveled with them in order to assist with their job, but Sylvia and Jenny were discouraged from doing the same out of concern for their safety and education. As a result, both sisters frequently stayed with their relatives, often their grandmother. In her teenage years, Sylvia Likens occasionally earned some spending money by babysitting and running errands or performing ironing chores for friends and neighbors, often giving her mother part of her earnings. She has been described as a friendly, confident, and lively girl with long, wavy, light brown hair extending below her shoulders and was known as Cookie to her friends. Although exuberant, Likens always kept her mouth closed when smiling due to a missing front tooth, which she had lost while roughhousing with one of her brothers during a childhood game. She was also fond of music, 
particularly the Beatles, and was notably protective of her remarkable, more limited and insecure young sister. On several occasions, the two sisters would visit a local skating rink where Sylvia would help Jenny skate by holding her hand and with Jenny skating on her unaffected foot. By June of the year of 1965, Sylvia and Jenny Likens resided with their parents in Indianapolis. On July 3rd, their mother was arrested and subsequently jailed for shoplifting. Shortly thereafter, Lester Likens arranged for her daughters to board with Gertrude Benzuski, the mother of two girls with whom the sisters had recently become acquainted with while studying at the Arsino Technical High School. Paula and Stephanie Benzuski, at the time of this boarding agreement, Gertrude assured Lester she would care for his daughters until his returns as if they were her own children. Shortly after July 4th holiday, the sisters moved into 3850 East New York Street in order for their father and later their mother to travel to East Coast with the carnival. With the understanding that Gertrude would receive weekly boarding fees of $20 to care for their daughters until they returned to collect Sylvia and Jenny in November of that year. During the initial weeks in which Sylvia and Jenny resided at the Benzuski's household, the sisters were subjected to very little discipline or abuse. Likens regularly sang along to pop records with Stephanie, and she willingly participated in housework at the Benzuski's residence. Both girls also regularly attended Sunday school with the Benzuski's children, with the pastor commending Sylvia's Heidi. Although Lester Likings had agreed to pay Gertrude Benzuski $20 a week in exchange for the care of his daughters, after approximately two weeks, these payments failed to consistently arrive upon the prearranged dates, occasionally arriving one or two days late. In response, Gertrude began venting her frustration at this fact upon the sisters by beating their bare buttocks with various instruments such as a one quarter inch thick six point millimeter paddle making statements such as well I took care of you two little bitches for a week for nothing on one occasion in late August both girls were beating approximately 15 times in the back with a aforementioned paddle after Paula had accused the sisters of eating too much food at a church supper for household children and attended. By mid-August, Gertrude Banzuski had begun to focus her abuse and almost exclusively upon Sylvia with her primary motivation likely being jealousy of the girl's youth, appearance, respectability, and the potential. According to subsequent trial testimony, this abuse was initially inflicted upon Sylvia after she and Jenny had returned to the Benzuski's residence for Arsenal High School as well as on weekends. The initial abuse included subject likings to beatings and starvation, forcing her to eat leftovers or spoiled milk out of garbage cans. And on one occasion, Likens was accused of stealing candy she had actually purchased. On another occasion, in late August, Likens was subjected to humiliation when she claimed to have a boyfriend in Long Beach, whom she had met in the spring of 1965 when their family lived in California. In response, Gertrude asked if Sylvia had everything done, anything with a boy, to which Likens, unsure of her meaning, replied, I guess so, and explained that she had gone skating with boys there and had once gone to a park on the beach with them. Continuing the conversation with Jenny and Stephanie, 
Sylvia mentioned that she had once laid under the covers with a boyfriend. Upon hearing this, Gertrude asked, Why did you do that, Sylvia? Likens replied, I don't know, and shrugged her shoulders. Several days later, Gertrude returned to the subject with Likens telling her, You're certainly getting big in your stomach, Sylvia. It looks like you're going to have a baby. Likens thought Gertrude was kidding with her and said, Yeah, it sure is getting big. I'm just going to have to go on a diet. Gertrude then told her and the other girls in the house that whenever they did something with a boy, they would be sure to have a baby. She then kicked lichens in her genitals. Paula herself, three months pregnant and also jealous of lichens' physical appearance, then participated in attacking lichens, knocking her off on her chair and onto the kitchen floor, shouting, you ain't fit to sit in this chair. On another occasion, as a family ate supper, Gertrude, Paula, and a neighborhood boy named Randy Gordon Leopard force-fed Likings a hot dog overloaded with condiments, including mustard, ketchup, and spices. Likings vomited as a result and was later forced to consume what she had regurgitated. In what was Likings' only act of retaliation, She is alleged to have spread a rumor of an Arsenal Technical High School that Stephanie and Paula Benzuski were prostitutes because she was upset with the household singling her out for similar accusations. While at school, Stephanie was jokingly propositioned by a boy who had told her that Likens had started this rumor about her. Upon returning home that day, Stephanie questioned Likens about the rumor and she admitted to starting it. Stephanie punched her in response, but Likens apologized to her in tears and Stephanie then also began to cry. However, when Stephanie's boyfriend, 15-year-old Coy Randolph Hubbard, heard of the rumor, he brutally attacked Likens, slapping her banging her head against the wall and flipping her backwards onto the floor. When Gertrude found out, she used a paddle to beat Likens. On another occasion, Paula beat Likens about the face with such force that she broke her own wrist, having primarily forced her blows upon Likens' feet and eyes and teeth. Later, Paula used a cast on her wrist to further beat Likens. Gertrude repeatedly falsely accused Likings of promiscuity and out of engaging in prostitution, ranting about the filthiness of prostitution and a woman in general. Gertrude would later occasionally force Jenny to strike her own sister, beating Jenny if she did not comply. Due to the increase in the frequency and brutality of the torture and mistreatment Likings was subjected to, she gradually became incontinent. She was denied any access to the bathroom, being forced to wet herself as a form of punishment for her inconsistence. On October 6th, Gertrude threw Likings into the basement and tied her up. Here, Likings was often kept naked, rarely fed, and frequently deprived of water. Occasionally, she was tied to the railing of the basement stairs, with her feet barely touching the ground. During all the abuse and while in the basement, on October 25th, Likings attempted to escape after overhearing a conversation between Gertrude and John Benzuski Jr., preliminary to the family's plan to abandon her to die. She attempted to flee to the front door. However, due to the extensive injuries and general weaknesses, Gertrude caught her before she could escape the property. Liking was then given crackers to eat, but was unable to consume the food due to her extreme state of dehydration. 
Gertrude forced the crackers into her mouth before repeatedly striking her face with a curtain rod until sections of the instrument were bent into right angles. Coy Hubbard then took the curtain rod from Gertrude and struck likings one further time, rendering her unconscious. Then Gertrude dragged her back into the basement. That evening, Likings desperately attempted to alert neighbors by screaming for help and hitting the walls of the basement with a spade. One immediate neighbor of the Benzuskis would later inform police she had heard the desperate commotion and that she had identified the source as emanting from the basement of 3850 East New York Street, but that as the noise had suddenly ceased at approximately 3 o'clock a.m., she decided not to inform the police about the disturbance. By the morning of October 26, Likings was unable to either speak intelligibly or correctly or coordinate the movement of her limbs. Gertrude moved Likings into the kitchen having propped her back against the wall, attempted to feed her a donut and a glass of milk. She threw Likings to the floor in frustration when Likings was unable to correctly move the glass of milk to her lips. She was then returned to the basement. On occasion, Gertrude and her 12-year-old son, John Jr., rubbed urine and feces from Gertrude's one-year-old son's diaper into Likings' mouth before giving her a cup half filled with water and stating the water was all she could receive for the remainder of the day. The next following morning, Gertrude discovered that Likings had urinated on herself. As a punishment, Likings was forced to insert an empty glass Coca-Cola bottle into her vagina in the presence of the Benazuski's children before Gertrude ordered her back into the basement. Shortly thereafter, Likings became delirious, repeatedly moaning and mumbling. When Paula asked her to recite the English alphabet, Likings was unable to recite anything beyond the first four letters and to raise herself off the ground. In response, Paula verbally threatened her to either stand up or she would inflict a long jump upon her. Gertrude then ordered Likens, who had defecated, to clean herself. Stephanie and Richard then decided to give Likens a warm, soapy bath and to dress her in new clothes. They then laid her upon a mattress in one of the bedrooms as Sylvia muttered in final wish that her daddy was there and that Stephanie would take her home. Stephanie then turned to her younger sister and stated, Oh, she'll be all right. When Stephanie realized that Likings was not breathing, she attempted to apply mouth-to-mouth resuscitation as Gertrude repeatedly shouted to the children in the house that Likings was faking her death. Likings was 16 years old when she was finally succumbed to her injuries. Gertrude Banzuski initially beat Likings' corpse with a book shouting faker 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 in order to rouse her however soon as she panicked and instructed richard hobbs to call the police from a nearby payphone when police arrived at her address at approximately 6 30 p.m gertrude led the officers to the likings emaciated extensively bludgeoned and mutilated body lying upon a soiled mattress in the bedroom before handing them the letter she had forced Likings to write previously before her dedication. She also claimed that she had been doctoring the child for an hour or more prior to her death, having applied rubbing alcohol to Likings' wounds in a fluttle attempt at first aid before she had died. She added that Likings had early run away from her home with several teenage boys before returning to her house early that afternoon, bare-breasted and clutching the note. Clutching a Bible, 
Paula Banizuski, having stated to all present in the household that Likey's death was meant to happen, then glanced in Jenny's direction and calmly stated, If you want to live with us, Jenny, we'll treat you like our own sister. As previously instructed by Gertrude, Jenny Likings recited the rehearsed version of events leading to Likings' death to police. Before whispering to the officers, you get me out of here, I'll tell you everything. The autopsy of Likings' body revealed she had suffered in excess of 150 separate wounds across her entire body. In addition to being extremely emaciated at the time of her death, the wounds themselves varied in locations, nature, severity, and the stage of healing. Her injuries included burns, severe bruising, and extensive muscle and nerve damage. Her vaginal cavity was almost swollen shut. Moreover, all of Liking's fingernails were broken backwards, and most of her external layers of skin upon the child's face, breast, neck, and right knee had peeled or receded in her death throes. Liking's had eventually bitten through her lips, partially severing sections of them before her face. The official cause of Liking's death was listed by a coroner, Dr. Arthur Cabell, as a subdural hematoma due to her receiving a severe blow to her right temple. Both the shock she had primarily suffered due to her severe and prolonged damage inflicted to her skin and subcutaneous tissues, plus the severe malnutrition, were listed as contributory factors to her death. Rigor mortis had fully developed at the time of the discovery of the body, indicating Likings may have been deceased for up to eight hours before she was found. Although Dr. Cabell did not, not note Likings had been recently bathed, possibly after death, and that his act has hastened the loss of a body temperature and has spread the onset of rigor mortis. On December 30th, 1965, the Marion County Grand Jury returned first-degree murder indictments against Gertrude Banizuski and two of her three eldest children, Paula and John Banizuski Jr. Also indicted were Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard. All were charged with having repeatedly struck, beaten, kicked, and otherwise inflicting a culmination of fatal injuries to Sylvia Likings with premeditated malice. On May 25th, Gertrude and Paula Banzuski were formally sentenced to life imprisonment the same day. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Banzuski Jr. each received sentences of 2 to 21 years to be served in the Indiana Reformatory. Over the course of the following 14 years, Gertrude Banizuski became known as a model prisoner of the Indiana Women's Prison. She worked in a prison sewing shop and was known as a somewhat of a den mother to young female inmates, becoming known to some with the prison by the name Mom. By the time of Gertrude's ultimate parole in 1985, she had changed her name to Nadine Van Falsane, a combination of her middle name and maiden name, and described herself as a devoted Christian. The news of Gertrude Banzuski's impending parole hearing created an uproar throughout Indiana. Within her parole hearing, Banzuski stated her wish that Likey's death could be a done. Although she minimized her responsibility for any of her actions, stating, I'm not sure what role I had in Liking's death because I was on drugs. I never really knew her. I take full responsibility for whatever happens to Sylvia, taking Gertrude's good conduct in prison into account. The parole board voted in favor of granting her parole. She was released from prison on December 4th, the year of 1985. Following her 
1985 year release from prison, Gertrude Benazuski relocated to Iowa. She never accepted full responsibility for Liking's prolonged torment and death, insisting she was unable to precisely recall any of the actions in the months of Liking's prolonged and increasing abuse and torment within her home. She primarily blamed her actions upon the medication she had been prescribed to treat for her asthma. Gertrude Benazuski lived relatively obscurity in Laurel, Iowa, until her death due to lung cancer on June 16th, the year of 1990, at the age of 61. The house at 3850 East New York Street in which Likings had been tortured and murdered stood vacant for many years after her death and the arrest of her tormentors. The property gradually became dilapidated, although discussions were held about the possibility of purchasing and rehabilitating the house and converting the property into a woman's shelter. The necessary funds to complete this project were never raised. The house itself was demolished on April 23rd, the year of 2009. The site is now a church parking lot. In June, the year of 2001, a six-foot-tall granite memorial was firmly dedicated to Sylvia Liking's life and legacy in Willard Park, Washington Street, Indianapolis. The dedication was intended by several hundred people, including members of the Likings family. The memorial itself is inscribed with these words. This memorial is in memory of a young child who died a tragic death. As a result, laws changed and awareness increased. This is a commitment to our children that the Indianapolis Police Department is working to make this a safe city for our children. Sylvia Liking's death is credited with the adoption of Indiana's mandated reporter law and with an increased understanding of the investigation and recognition of abuse. The law states that should a member of the public suspect a child is suffering abuse or neglect, the citizen suspecting this abuse has a legal obligation to report this abuse to authorities.